Thank you so much, Pastor Craig. Uh, if you can't tell yet this morning, uh, the bench players are in, so lower the expectations right now, please. <laughs> um, but uh, for those of you who are visiting with us, my name is Gideon Mangus. I am the middle school director here at Christ Church. I just want to welcome you guys in this morning. For those of you who are joining online, welcome as well. We're happy to have you worshiping alongside of us. Uh, I- I'm incredibly excited today, and I'm incredibly excited at the opportunity that we have here together to open up the word of God and to ask him to reveal himself to us. You know, I'm excited for the opportunity that we have to grow this morning deeper in our knowledge and in our love of the Father. And especially on this New Year's Day, as we're on the cusp of a new year, that we have the opportunity to set a precedent for the next 365 days. As Pastor Craig mentioned, he he told me about this four months ago. And so I've had a while to come before God and say, God, what is it that you would have me say to your people? Because if it's up to me, I got nothing to say and we'll be out of here in two minutes. But if you show up and you speak through me that you have something of substance to give to your church. And as I pray, there's one thing that God has put on my heart over and over again. It's a simple prayer for us. And, And this morning, the prayer is this. God, make us a people full of zeal for your glory. You know, my goal today is simply this, is to help raise our eyes to gaze at the glory of God so that we would be full full of a love for him and full of a joy in him. You guys pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to gather together here. Lord, we come before you this morning asking that you would reveal yourself to us. God, we have one heart and one mind and one desire, and that is to grow deeper in our faith, to grow deeper in our knowledge and in our love of you. And we know that this isn't something that we can work out on our own. We're insufficient in and of ourselves to do that. But you, God, are a God who makes yourself known. And so, Father, we ask that you come and you open our eyes that we can see you. Lord, this morning I ask that you would reveal to us your glory, which has been demonstrated in your word. Be high and lifted up in this room and in our hearts. Fill us, God, with the heavenly zeal and passion and vigor for your glory to shine through us in our lives. Lord, we pray this, asking that you would come and fill this place with your spirit. Don't just let us be hearers of your word, God, but doers. Don't just stir our hearts, but change us. We lift This next 30 minutes up to you, God. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Hey, we're going to be rooted this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, um, starting in verse 12, which Pastor Craig read for us this morning, but I just want to read it again to frame this message. And I would encourage you, if you brought your Bible this morning, take it out. Um, follow along. If you didn't bring your Bible, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. The words will also be on the screen behind me. We're going to begin in verse 12. It says this, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Well, like I said, the prayer for this morning 
is for us to be filled with a zeal for the glory of God. And I don't think there's more appropriate time than right now in this New Year's Day, as we're on the verge of a brand new year, for us to take a moment to reflect on and to think about the purpose and the place of God's glory in our lives. You know, I don't know about you, but New Year's is one of my favorite times of year. I love this part of the year because it's full of this excitement and this anticipation for a new beginning. There, there comes with New Year's this expectation for a fresh start. And we, we can see this most in the ways that we make New Year's resolutions. Uh, if you don't have a New Year's resolution yet this year, I have a few suggestions for us as a family of families to have some New Year's resolutions. Uh, the first one I found as I was looking these up online, top ones, is for kids. So if you have kids in the room, you might want to write this down. New Year's resolution for your kids is this. I will start coloring on paper instead of the walls. Pretty good one. This is a good one. Uh, for adults in the room, I have one for you as well. It's, I will stop picking fights with strangers on the internet. I sent this one to my mom and earlier. I said, delete Facebook, mom, please. Please delete it. For slightly older adults in the room, maybe this one is for you. I will finally learn to use the internet. Maybe that one. <laughs> Save your kids a headache, please. <laughs> you know, the thing about a New Year's resolution is this. A New Year's resolution is supposed to increase the joy in your life by transforming something about your life. It's supposed to produce joy through life transformation. And the reason I want us, wanted us to think about that this morning is that as we're going to be diving into the glory of God, gazing at the glory of God, what we're going to see in the scripture is this, that God's glory is actually the source of our joy and transformation. That the glory of God is actually supposed to produce joy through life change. That it transforms our hearts, it transforms our attitudes and our actions, and it moves us to be overflowing with this divine and radical joy. And that's actually so important for us today because the reality of the situation is this, is that we think about joy and life change. Most people today are living in less than what God has intended for their life. You know, most people today have settled in for a life that is just kind of going through the motions and getting by, rather than a life that is full of radical joy that is rooted in the person of God. You know, most people have settled into a life of bored apathy, not really caring, rather than a life of divine contentment. And there's a stark difference between the two of those. Joy nowadays is seen as a bonus when life is going well, rather than our typical condition of operation. Like joy is rooted to like circumstances and little moments of pleasure rather than being rooted in our God. And if that's you this morning, you know, if you walked in here this morning, if you're watching online and you're feeling stale in your walk with God, if you're feeling low on the joy of the Lord in your life, I want to encourage you, that's not God's intended MO for your life. That what we're going to see today is that when we gaze on the glory of God, it should fill us with this radical joy. And so that's the summary of today's message. It's this, that God's glory is the source of our radical joy and transformation. And amazingly, our radical joy and transformation is an instrument of God's glory. When we behold and gaze on the glory of God, it should fill us with joy and transform our lives. And when we respond in joy and life transformation, it actually goes back and glorifies God. And when we as a church understand this truth and this framework, it gives us the framework to be able to live a life that is full of joy and also glorifies God. And so this morning, there are just four points to unpack this truth of the relationship between God's glory and our joy. And they're this. We're going to look at the definition of God's glory. We are going to look at the place of God's glory. We're going to look at the pinnacle of God's glory and the product of God's glory. Now, when we're looking at, okay, a definition of God's glory, coming to a working definition of the glory of God is, is a little bit easier said than done. And the reason being is that glory in the Bible has a couple different meanings, depending on what context you're looking at, who it's describing. And the second problem is this, is that the type of glory we normally talk about is really different than the glory that we ascribe to God. So glory today is simply this. It's an honor that is received or won through a notable achievement. 
You know, if you, you think of a soldier, a soldier wins glory by doing something heroic in battle. They win glory because of their service and their sacrifice, but glory really isn't this intrinsic attribute of the soldier. You know, before they enlisted, they didn't have that glory. Glory was really a response or result of their action. Now, when we think about God, this is completely different than the glory of God. Glory is an attribute of the being of God. God is glorious. Before there's any person to see God and ascribe to him glory, God still had glory. You know, Jesus says this in John 17, 5. He says, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Before there was anything, God had glory. And so when you look at the scripture in the context of God's glory, the definition that we can come up with is this. The glory of God is the magnificence, worth, loveliness, and splendor of his many perfections, which he communicates through his acts of creation and redemption. It's a big sentence. Let's break it down. The glory of God is the beauty and the splendor of his being. It, it, it's the overwhelming awesomeness. I'm a middle school pastor, so I have to use that word awesomeness of, his, of who he is. The glory of God is the worth and the value and the wonderfulness of himself. And even more so, the glory of God is the very thing he uses to reveal himself to us. It's what God uses to communicate who he is and what he's all about. Piper says this, it's the going public of his holiness. And God expresses his glory. He communicates this glory in two really specific ways, through creating and redeeming us. God communicates who he is in his act of creation and redemption, which brings us to the second, to the second point, which is where is the place of God's glory? The next logical question is this, okay, so where does God's glory fit into the story? Where is the purpose and place of God's glory in this whole story? And the answer is this, is that God's glory is the purpose of this whole story. The entire plot and purpose of the universe of all of this is for God to reveal his glory to us and for us to respond in joyfully glorifying him. God's desire is to both reveal his glory and to be glorified in us. R.C. Sproul writes this, that the highest aim of our God is to reveal his glory. God's motivation is his glory. In all that he does, he does for the sake of his glory and to reveal his glory. Let's see this play out in creation. Okay, what we see in creation is that God in creation is demonstrating magnificently his glory. Psalms 19.1 says this, the heavens declare the glory of God. And Psalm 97.6 says this, the heavens proclaim his righteousness. Why? So all people see his glory. And so in creation, God is revealing, this is the type of God I am. I'm a God of beauty and splendor. In the, the highest point of creation, the, the culmination of creation is God creating mankind. And how does God create mankind? He creates mankind in his image. Mankind is an image bearer. And now an image is supposed to be a reflection, a copy that points back and glorifies the original. And so God fills this creation with billions and billions of reflections of himself. And he gives them a specific purpose and calling, which is to be his ruler and cultivator and his ambassador here on earth. And even more specifically, and by doing that, to delight in all that he has made. You know, the Westminster Catechism begins with this simple question and answer. It asks this, what is the chief end of man? What is the purpose of mankind? And as we're thinking about a new year, that's a good question for us to ask. What is our purpose? And it answers that question by saying this, that the purpose of mankind is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. You know, many non-believers who read the Bible and see this, and see a God who acts on behalf of his own glory, they'll complain that, that our God's an egomaniac. That, that, that any God who does anything so that he would be glorified is not a God worth worshiping. That any God who creates people to glorify himself has this horrible ego problem. 
And so now we have to rectify this thing. Okay, so how do we rectify a God who acts on behalf of his glory with a God who reveals himself to be all love? And the reason I brought up that catechism is because it does it beautifully. You see, the answer is this, that in glorifying God, we are brought into greater enjoyment of him. In enjoying God, we glorify him. And in glorifying God, we are brought into a greater joy. Get this, this is amazing. That God created mankind to find its greatest joy in fulfilling its very purpose, which is to glorify him by being a reflection of his role in goodness here on earth. You see, when we function as we were created to function, it leads to our flourishing and joy as well as God's glory. It's not, it's not an egomaniac. God, in revealing his glory, is inviting us to come and delight in him. And we see the exact same process revealed in God's redemption of mankind. We know mankind sins and rejects God. Romans tells us that though we knew God, we neither glorified him or thanked him, and we exchanged his glory for the image of idols. And in this act of rebellion, what happens is that it opens up the opportunity for our God to reveal the pinnacle of his glory. In the pinnacle of God's glory, the pinnacle of who he is is this. It's his grace. Ephesians lays this out for us incredibly. Paul writes this. For God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love... He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. Other translations say to the praise of the glory of his grace. God's act of the redemption of mankind was done for two reasons. It was done out of a love for mankind and out of a desire to reveal his glory to us. You see, the pinnacle of God's glory, the pinnacle of God revealing who he is and what he's all about is him sending his son. Hebrews 1.3 says the son is the radiance of God's glory. Jesus Christ is the ultimate demonstration of the glory of our God. The pinnacle of God's glory is him sending his son to die so that we might live. Him sending his son to die so that we might once again be reunited with him and have our joy and delight being rooted in him. You know, and that brings us to the product of God's glory. Where does God's glory intersect with our life? Why are we doing this? Is this just a, a thought experiment? No. The reality is this, is that the glory of God should have a tangible reality in each of our lives. The product of God's glory is twofold. It's a life that seeks to glorify him and a heart that rejoices in him. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 3. We're going to pick up in verse 12 again. And Paul is in the middle of comparing the glory of the old covenant of Moses and the law to the overwhelming and surpassing glory of the new covenant of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he writes this, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Paul's hope here is that in the greater glory of the new covenant, we've been given the gift of his spirit so that people's eyes are opened and hearts are transformed. He says, because of this, because of this hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. So Paul here is referencing Exodus 33. And in Exodus 33, we have this interaction between Moses and God. And Moses is in the presence of God. And he says, God, I want to see your glory. And God says, if you see my face, you're, you're, you're going to die. So you can't do that. But what I'll do is I'll hide you in this rock. And I will let my glory pass in front of you. And I'll let you see the tail end of my glory. And so that happens. And Moses comes face to, to, the tail, comes face, to face with the tail end of God's glory. And in doing that, what the scripture says is that his face was transformed and it became radiant. That, that, that it began to glow and shine out. And when Moses came down and, and saw the Israelites, it was so unsettling to see his face that they asked him to put a veil over it because they couldn't stand being in the presence, in the, in, in the sight of someone who was in the presence of the glory of God. And Paul's using this story 
of what happened when Moses saw God's glory as a preview of what is going to happen and what happens in our hearts and lives when we come face to face with the glory of God. And he describes this in verse 18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, the product of God's glory is a radical joy in life transformation. When the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see what God has revealed about himself, to see who God has revealed himself to be, it changes us in a tangible way. Paul is saying that in the same way when Moses came in contact with the living God, there was this tangible evidence of it, that when we as believers come in contact with the glory of the Lord, there is a transformation. It transforms our desires, our actions, and our attitudes so that we begin to look more and more like Jesus Christ, who Hebrews already said is the radiance of God's glory. You see, what we see is this, when we lift our eyes to behold the glory of the Lord, the Spirit changes us so that we're actually filled with this desire to glorify God. You know, Christ in John 17 said that his desire here on earth was to glorify his Father. Not, not out of desperation, but out of this overwhelming love and enjoyment of his presence. That's our same mission as believers to glorify God out of an overwhelming love and enjoyment of him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, do everything as unto the glory of the Lord. And so what? Oh, why does this matter? Well, there's an opportunity for us. And the opportunity is to live our lives with this heavenly intentionality, to live a purpose-filled life. If we come in here this morning feeling purposeless and lost, there's hope. God has given us a purpose and an opportunity, which is in every breath and every morning that we take to glorify him. To glorify him in every single second of our lives. You know, that was the purpose of the, the goodwill cards that we gave out earlier throughout the Christmas season. To, to have an opportunity, whether big or small, to glorify God in every chance that we got. You know, if you want a goal for 2023... Uh, we're talking about some of those fake, funny um, New Year's resolutions. This, this actually should be one, which is this. It's Christ be glorified in my life. Christ, let my life be an instrument of your glory. That's the first product of, of beholding the glory of the Lord is that we have a life, we live a life that desires to glorify him. The second product of God's glory is actually a way that we can begin to glorify God in our life, which is this. It, it, it's a life that is full of radical joy. Part of the way that we can glorify God is by being joyful in him. You know, John Piper has this profound line, which is this. He says, God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. You know, Piper here isn't talking about manufacturing happiness or saying that, or, you know, God's glorified when you're satisfied, so you should try to satisfy every little desire, no? Like, eat 15 Snickers a day because you are not you when you're hungry, no? It's, it's not at all what Piper's saying there. What, what, what he's saying is this, is that God is glorified when I'm satisfied in him, when my joy is rooted in him question for us this morning is this, is your joy linked to your circumstances or to your God? You know, when we're talking about this radical joy, the, the root of the word radical, that's an intentional word because the root of radical is actually the word root. A radical joy is a rooted joy. It's a joy that is anchored in who God is and what he's done for us. And I gotta say, if your joy isn't anchored in God, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like me having a boat, me putting it in an ocean, but not tying it to a dock. And then coming back the next day and wondering why the waves have taken it away. Because it's not rooted in anything. It's not tethered to anything. But whenever we root our joy and whether, whether we tether our joy to who God is and what he's done, it doesn't leave when the waves and the storms of life have come. You know, some of us in here, have been living with a joy that's based on circumstantial happiness and little moments of pleasure, and we wonder why we aren't living with this radical, profound joy. 
God has given us the opportunity to root our joy in him. You know, as we close, let me take this one step farther for us this morning. You see, this joy is not only a response to God's glory. It's not only an instrument of God's glory, but radical joy is actually the necessary fuel for the Christian life. Nehemiah in chapter 8, 10 says this. He says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. His strength in life is rooted in his delight in God. His strength in life is rooted in the joy he finds in being in the presence of the Father. And this happens in any circumstance. You know, the very next verse in 2 Corinthians, after 3.18, is 2 Corinthians 4.1, which says this, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. This is the same chapter which Paul goes on to say this. He says, we're hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And he finishes that thought by saying this, all of this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. And therefore, we do not lose heart. The joy of the Lord is the fuel for the Christian life. The joy of the Lord is the only way to make it through the present trials. And so as we leave here this morning, we're thinking about, okay, so what, what does this mean for us? I have a few questions. Is the glory of God evident in you? Is your face radiant? Is it shining out that you have come in contact with the living, true God? Is there such a visible and tangible and unshakable joy about you that others are saying, man, what is that? If, if we want to engage our culture, do you know what's attractive to unbelievers? This unshakable joy rooted in God. You can't have that anywhere else. That doesn't come any other way than being able to say, wow, God has made me and has revealed his glory. And because he's revealed himself, I get to delight in him and walk with him. You know, this year, let's be zealous for the glory of God to shine out of our lives. Let's be full of this unshakable joy that is rooted in who he is and what he's done. And more than anything else, let us seek to glorify him in every breath that we have. Let's pray, church. Well, Father God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. Lord, we thank you for the joy that we receive because of who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done for us. That death is defeated and new life is offered us in him. Lord, we ask that our lives would be a reflection of who you are, that we would be able to bear the image of Jesus Christ everywhere we go, that there would be a tangible reality to our lives where we say, yeah, we've come in contact with the living King. Father, let this year be a year where we glorify you. We pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.